I started singing when I was at least three, or as little as three, perhaps I should say, rather than at least. Um, and a friend of my mother's has said to me all my life, you didn't sing like a three-year-old, so I had to start a singing group for you. And she taught me all sorts of songs that I didn't know were traditional English songs, but I now do know that. Um, and I just loved singing them. And I carried on from there, really. How about you, John? I suppose I just sang constantly. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think as a child, you just sort of, you sing and it's not a thing. You're just singing because it's, it's what you do. And my sister is a singer as well. And so we used to sing all the time together when we were little. Trained at the Conservatory in Birmingham and then sang and have just been singing as and when I can since. How about you, Sam? You've got a link to Conservatory as well, don't you? Yeah, so um, my dad's a guitarist. Um, well, he's predominantly a lot lorry driver. It's kind of a hobby thing, but I remember going um, with his band to places and me just screaming at the top of my lungs, all kinds of stuff. I started properly when I was a chorister. Um, I was about seven, uh, St. Oswald's in Oswestry, and then it, I, I was there for a very long time. Um, and then joined Escathedra and then went off and studied at the Conservatoire as well in Birmingham and I've just finished my master's degree so. What's being a chorister like? I mean, everyone says it's an amazing training apart from everything else but does that change your relationship with singing at all when you're so young and you're being made to work so hard? It's a, it's a good discipline. It's a massive wake-up call when you first join but it was, it was amazing being surrounded by it all and that is really where my love of music came from. It's something really special, especially like the, the cohort of the people you're working with. with all of us like when in ex cathedra it's kind of the same when i first joined which was like a few years ago um i was made feel very very welcome you know i was petrified just like a little country bumpkin from oswald street coming in the big city <laughs> i walked in and it, it was just absolutely lovely so it's just the love it literally is the, the fundamental love of music music making <laughs>
what you're describing is a, is a way of life more than a kind yeah. of commitment to anything like that. It goes deeper, doesn't it? And and Roz, how about you? I actually started as a cornet trumpet player. And when I went to university, my first study was the trumpet. Um, and it wasn't until I got there, and sure, choirs and things to change the choir, um, but really my love of singing uh, started to come out, and I started singing lessons. Really, then after that, I went to Dubai and discovered, well, I was asked to conduct choir, and I discovered this love of conducting, which is really what I'm going to do now. I mean, I sing with extra theatre, and it's a huge, huge privilege, but mostly I conduct. It's interesting, Ross, that I was a horn player and you were a trumpeter. I wonder if conducting and brass go hand in hand, it seems to. <laughs> seems to be the case here. How, did one lead, is it obviously through singing you both came to conducting, but do you think some of the skills, I obviously can see that the breathing thing is a, is a big link between brass and singing. So that seems very logical, but conducting and singing I don't know, I've always, when I've played with um, choral conductors conducting an orchestra, we as, as orchestral players struggle a lot more with the style of conducting that choral singers bring. Now, obviously there's a, a completely different skill set to conducting voices than conducting um, instruments. So how, how is that all linked for you? I think um, really I found with my conducting of all the choirs, but it's my knowledge of how to sing and all that technical side, because I teach singing as well. That is what I can impart to a choir and improve them. Um, I've only ever once um, conducted with an orchestra, and it was out in Dubai, and I had three choirs and, and a, quite a big orchestra, and I'd never done it before. And I said to my husband afterwards, if I ever suggest doing this again, take me out and shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> that bad, that terrifying. Oh, my goodness. It went absolutely fine. But actually, looking back, I'd actually really enjoyed it. It was a great experience, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Marianne? Have you conducted uh, well, an orchestra as well? Um, I've had experience of conducting an orchestra, but I have not, I can't say I've conducted orchestras. I have I've conducted an orchestra with a choir. I'd, I'm not, I would, I would like to, it's not something that I would say I don't want to do. Um, I'm very aware it's a different skill. I've done some training on, you know, conducting an orchestra with a baton and theory, proper orchestral conducting, but I haven't actually done it. Um, <laughs> 
but it's interesting that you were saying about being asked to conduct a choir in Dubai because I came to conducting um, unintentionally really because I'd as a teenager well in fact I've probably only about 12 I was very very involved with the organization Sing for Pleasure which was a fantastic and is a fantastic organization but at that time when I was a teenager the founder members were still involved and um, I just thought that it was the most wonderful organization ever um, and one of the things about it was that singing was taught to large groups of people or small groups of people with not necessarily any knowledge of music reading so even when music was used sheet music was used everything was taught by rote and what i picked up as a teenager was what is now called pitch patterning it meant that you know you could sing a line and pitch pattern it and encourage and help somebody else to sing it back and the the pitch patterning with the hand was a very good teaching tool. When I was then training as a teacher and I was doing my teaching practice, obviously I was doing quite a lot of singing involved in that with the children in school. And the head teacher at the time said, oh, I sing in a choir and we're looking for somebody to, um, to take over as the leader. I don't know if you're interested. So I went along as planned and I thought that they were going to sing for me and then we were going to see what happened. So I went totally unprepared and I got there and they just sat and looked at me <laughs> and waited. And I went, what do I know that I can teach really quickly to this group of people? And the only thing I could think of all the way through was actually really quite a complicated thing um, with a lot of quite twiddly runs in it and I sang it to them and they looked at me and went we can't do that and I said yes you can and I used the sing for pleasure method of breaking it down into chunks and that was it. Now, can you can you remember what that piece was that you taught them? Oh I can I've taught it since. <laughs> it's a, a piece called Cantate Domino and yeah I've used it since with, with choirs who go we can't do that. I'm like, yes you can. <laughs> so conducting has, is that featuring at all for you, Sam? Are you, have you been bitten by the bug? I have, yeah. <laughs> um, it first came about, um, so, when it, actually when I was a chorister, so uh, it was for the Gold Award, the RSCM. Um, we followed that scheme, the Royal School of Church Music, and uh, as part of the Gold Award, you have to kind of organise a service and stuff, and the Director of Music um, said that you can, you can organise a service, but if you organise it and organise the music, you have to conduct it. I don't know, it's just the most amazing feeling. And I remember the first comment he said, it's just like, you conduct as you sing. It's conduct as you feel. I don't know about you guys, when you're being conducted by a person who has who is a singer, it's completely different. And you know what they want, they know, you know their intentions, and you breathe with them and convey the emotion they want you to convey and I love that about conducting because you can just be so experimental with you know just a simple movement and creating this energy in the room this um you know this, this fizz. It's just really interesting that you and Marianne have both said something about the physical expression of your singing one with a pitching with your hand mm -hmm. um but for you Sam you, what you've just said about it being a sort of physical manifestation of of what's going on in you as a mm -hmm. singer but that is the barrier that i think instrumentalists have because you have a thing in your hands and and you, that's how you're expressing your music whereas with the voice obviously it's completely part of you anyway so I, that's a really lovely thing that you you can use your body so naturally to express what you want because you're already doing it and Gemma, are you are you also in the business of conducting? Yeah, I I, I mean I, I do conduct. Um, I I was up until January um, assistant director of music at St Lawrence's Church in Ludlow. So and we've got junior choristers and an adult choir. And stuff. Well, <laughs> not the moment, <laughs> but um, when when everything is well and with the world, we have junior choristers <laughs> and we have. Um, 
adult singers as well. And I was I was sort of acting director of music for a bit as well. So I've conducted them, um, and it, it, very much the same. Um, because of course, singing doesn't start with the first sound. It the, the the whole process of breathing and getting into that zone that that conduct when you were conducting a choir that's part of it and and so if you go you expect it, it it's not you're not going to get a proper breath and you're not going to get the, the the phrasing and the flow of everything that you want so i think that's possibly why um it's it, it's completely different one of the reasons why it's completely different i've been fortunate to sing for quite a lot of different conductors um and i've noticed as a result of that so many different styles um, and it's not just about what they're used to conducting it's where they come from as well because certain sort of countries have a different way of doing stuff and I'm, I'm thinking of one conductor in particular he conducts a radio choir in Finland and I think because it's a radio choir it's a lot more precise to the point and we found that very difficult to adapt to because we're used to this more kind of flowing style of conducting um, and we were doing Messian's um, Saint Crochon um, which is a very intense piece of music if anyone's ever done that before um, it's um, it's amazing piece of music but it is so there's what's of one of the movements in that that um I think it's the sopranos and tenors have to sing a semitone apart and the altos and basses have to sing a semitone apart and which mm. is <laughs> really hard but but he was perfect for that role absolutely perfect for, for teaching that specific piece because it was so precise and his method of conducting was so on it made me think about how different conductors actually are really good at conducting certain things and um, in certain styles and where they come from and how how they usually work influences so when they go and um, guest conduct for different um, different groups it's um, it must be really challenging for them I do enjoy conducting but I think singing for me is more where it's at than conducting I do enjoy the conducting I like the control <laughs> <laughs> And what you're all also referencing in your conducting is this element of, of training that, that I think is unique to, to choral conducting, where you have, it's so much more hands-on, that um, particular side of it than orchestral conducting, I think. Um, so obviously that's a big part of, of what you're doing in your conducting as well, really building, training, molding. Um, and have you, any of you managed um, to keep the choirs that you were involved with going through lockdown? I'd be fascinated to hear how, if you have, that that's been possible. It's not really very possible because you can't, you can't all sing at the same time because of the delay. Um, but it, it is interesting. Um, I've been doing just recording with my chamber choir. Um, and they found that horrific, um, the process of just listening to yourself on your own. Because as a choir singer, you're so used to trying to blend with everybody. Um, and then you have to do it on your own. And it, it just instills panic. You have to get past that sense of panic um, and learn what your own voice sounds like. Uh, I've done a lot of vid uh, vid virtual choir um, and I think members of my choir have been doing that too to keep ourselves going and there are loads of them out there um, but if you're videoing yourself you can see what you're doing technically which is fascinating I've totally enjoyed um, singing in all these virtual choirs I was reading something very interesting that um, Eric Whitaker has said about um, his virtual sixth choir has just um, has just 
publish the, the latest um, piece, which is a piece with King um, But the amount of community, sense of community, and sense of actually singing in a choir, 17 and a half thousand people have got from singing that. And I suspect some of these choirs will continue after lockdown because people are really enjoying it. And, you know, you can sing with a choir with members from all over the world. Obviously, there are a lot of singers on the various social media platforms um, making a lot of noise about singing um, in lockdown and about keeping the opera houses and various um, companies going. And there's a lot of really fantastic online stuff um, coming out. I know the Bite Size Proms, for example, is, is run and was started by a singer Jennifer Johnson. So a lot of very creative people in the world of singing. But it's interesting that you said, Ros, that you think there's, there's life beyond lockdown for these virtual choirs. Um, because obviously, I think it goes without saying, we are all missing live music with other live people in the same room hugely. So obviously, um, it's a very kind of interesting point to have reached that, that we're also seeing a potential future for um, digital and online things. But tell me about um, how you've been feeling during lockdown about your your singing. I'm quite down, I'd say, about that. I mean, I've, I've, I lost so much work absolutely loads of work um, and that obviously has a financial impact but it also has an impact on the fact that I now don't sing well I know that's really affected my mental health I need to sing I need to do something I mean we're talking about a virtual choir <laughs> concert here so it's still just me with um, a pile of books trying to balance my phone to against a plain background um, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get all the notes right and not look strange at the same time. <laughs> so it's still, it's still that. And so it's still not satisfying um, in that sense. But it's hopefully going to get my vocal health and my um, technique sort of heading in the right direction rather than me just continuing to go down this. I think the, the last time I sang in front of someone was when the beginning of March when we did the opera. Um, at the conservatoire and since then we haven't I haven't sung in front of anyone I've literally been at home with a camera singing into the screen nothing nothing beats the adrenaline of a performance you're I'm, I mean I'm perfectly petrified petrified especially just before a performance I'm like why do I keep doing this to myself why like, <laughs> I mean, once you get into it, it, the feeling of it is nothing else, and it's just, it's just amazing, because it's, it's a constant feedback loop you give, whether that's the, being a core singer or a soloist, is you give, you know, your your voice, you to, you know, the audience, and they give back with what they hear. And it's a constant wheel, so you know we. We exude our energy, we get uh, feedback back from them, and then we give them, they give it again. I thrive on working towards something, uh, and I think singers and performers are all the same. You know, is thinking, right, okay, what, what's next? What's next, right? I need X amount of time to do this, to sing it, be able to do it properly. And when all that's taken away, no matter, no matter how tired you are, when you've got so much work, you always find the energy to do it, because you know what it needs doing. And, you know, you're looking forward to performing it. When you don't have that, it's really hard to find the motivation. And I, for one, have, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I've really struggled. I found very quickly I wasn't actually able to sing in the end because the voice is connected to emotion. That's how we emote, you know. And then, of course, like with you, Gemma, you know, that's the outlet. And we soon, you soon, like, feel like you have no purpose, you lose that bit of yourself. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting better now, I'm getting more myself, but 
there was a moment where I totally lost, like, who I was. It was almost like I didn't recognise myself, like, in the mirror or felt myself. And then I realised the missing element, or one of the main missing elements, was the fact that I couldn't sing anymore. And I, I never realised how much I relied on singing to be me. But we are all moving towards the, the, the same thing, and we are still trying to, to work. I, mean, I think as important people in, you know, in the world understands that, you know, we just need a little bit of support, really, just to, you know, and also, I think I think the realization with the important people who can help that that music works six months or a year in advance of itself, and saying that things can reopen and restart, that we can't just wave a magic wand and 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 make it happen. I was struck by something Gemma said earlier on um, that you have been collaborating on. We both um, are vocal tutors for Excathedra. Um, and we both for many years have worked on the Excathedra's Singing Medicine Project, which is at Birmingham Children's Hospital in normal times. On Friday morning, Thomas woke up. It's sunny, it's sunny again. I can ride my bike with my dad today. It's sunny. We're at Birmingham Children's Hospital today for our weekly singing medicine visit. It's sunny, it's sunny. Singing Medicine is a singing project for children in hospital with life-limiting conditions. It aims to bring all those wider, wonderful benefits of singing to children in hospital. Can you blink? <laughs> Just, Just like me. I think that it's, it's the, the joy and the spirit of singing and people feeling lifted and, and for a moment perhaps they can, they can enter into that place of real pure enjoyment and sing and have fun. Now music and singing does that to all of us. It does that all the time. You can be lifted out of your humdrum life by a piece of music and somewhere your head is somewhere else. Well, if you can do that for someone, if you can take them out of that, what a wonderful, liberating thing to be able to do. Guess how she will be? Oh, you're cross. She will be very, very cross. Kira loves doing singing medicine, but she has to stay very still while she's having her dialysis. So we have to be quite calm and close to her. So it was a very still version of Under the Covers rather than the rowdy one we sometimes do with the whole crowd. Very, very happy. I will be very, very happy. That's how I will be. If you had the opportunity to give singing, say, to all children in the country, why would you not include them? Why would you exclude them from the excitement and the uh, enjoyment and the education, all those things that are going on for other children. I've been working on this unit for 22 years and since the introduction of singing medicine I've seen a real difference in our patients' response to their treatment and their recovery. She, as soon as she sees you, if she sees anyone in a purple t-shirt, she thinks singing medicine are here and that's it, there's a big smile on her face. It's imperative that children who can't be in the classroom are also given that opportunity. I would want every child on every ward in every hospital to have the opportunity to be involved with singing medicine. He really enjoys himself and, and can feel that bit brighter. There's a reason to get to the end of the week because singing medicine is going to be there. We have been um, with our colleagues working on a, a digital version. Um, Rebecca, our Director of Education, worked tirelessly to get agreement from funders of the project that we could use some of the money to create videos um, for children who were now in isolation everywhere because what the project is about is children in isolation in hospital and so yes we've been recording all sorts of songs and games and trying to devise ways in which when you're not actually with the child you can still make those singing games interactive this is for children isolated everywhere in the world and it's been available thus far it's been available free on youtube and facebook we've learned loads haven't we um in doing it we, we i mean we've learned first of all i i know that zoom exists that's the first thing i've learned yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's global so it now has a global reach um so happy smiley faces all around the world and i think that that's a really positive thing to come out of this. 
if you hadn't ever seen, I'm just thinking about Ex Cathedra because that's that links us all. We're all part of Ex Cathedra. Um, if you'd never seen an Ex Cathedra concert before, but you maybe have now because we we put one out there. We did a summer holiday concert, and we also did some Easter week virtual choir performances as well. So it might be that was your first time that you've seen Ex Cathedra. And that might inspire you in 2021 to come and actually watch a live concert because you've enjoyed the virtual experience. And so it might inspire you to come and watch a real live concert with real life people. It's, it's fantastic to hear that you're, spread, you're spreading wellness through, through singing. We all, we all know that music and, and health are completely linked, aren't they? Specifically singing and health, but in times when other less good things are spreading in the form of viruses to, to be able to spread your your positivity like that is amazing but it's obviously um it's not a straightforward thing because as you've described sam this feedback loop that you get um from interacting with a live audience you you so you're putting all this positive energy out Gemma, and marianne all of you you're putting putting this into the world you know that there is good coming of it but you can't feel it that i think is the one remaining insurmountable problem with digital and with virtual with online things is is we can't really actually feel the validity of what we're doing particularly with singing one of the things is not just the feedback loop from an audience which is i think real with all musicians and all performers one of the things about singing which has been proven is that it's one of the very very few activities that humans in, do which produces oxytocin and oxytocin is the bonding hormone it's the and it's singing together with others in a group so we can all sing for all we're worth at home and that will not do the same produ production of oxytocin as were the the four of us singing together in a group that would give us an actual hormonal boost i was just going to add to that um as well marianne um because this sort of, you've just kind of led on to a really serious point which <laughs> is um the fact that we're now being told that singing is dangerous um it, it's dangerous for our health it's dangerous because it passes all these aerosol discussions and everything about the um the spread of the virus through the the um the aerosol effect of singing when we when we when we expel our sound we're we're going to we have to stand at least three meters apart from everybody and this that and the other and and that's only if you actually understand the guidance that's being given which is extremely wishy-washy professionals are allowed to sing but um, amateurs aren't allowed to sing and this that and the other that's going on at the moment it's it's just it's not evidence-based at all but what concerns me most and this is why i i thought about it marianne is the fact that we're undervaluing the um the mental health benefits of singing and we're saying that the spread of this virus even though this isn't actually proven with any science at the moment um is is, is just going to completely wipe away all of that um, evidence, real evidence that there is about oxytocin, about um, mental health, about how singing actually makes people feel better. They're, they're saying this and they're putting this out, you say based on no real evidence, but the research has already been done, um, albeit in laboratories, and it was done months ago now and available and ignored, but singing, projects the particles no more than half a meter so i mean we've gone back to i've got another session this afternoon with my excavator community choir on zoom which is not ideal but you know at least they get together they get to see each other they get to talk and that's also hugely important with excavator we've also got um the academies of vocal music um and they go from three-year-olds up to six form leavers and um, within the children's academy we also um, accommodate um, a child who is deaf we have a signer holly um, and so zoom obviously created a whole new um, access 
conundrum, shall we say, for allowing this um, this child to <laughs> to access the rehearsals. And I've got to say, those rehearsals work really well. The children love it. They're once a month. They come online. They're so full of colour and. But I think it's brilliant that despite the fact that we're all living on a screen, this child has been able to access and take part to a really enjoyable level as well, these rehearsals. You have to keep sort of going back and saying what worked, what didn't work, and, and just trying to make it even more accessible every time. Um, never, never to be complacent with it. I've loved, loved, loved singing the all the Baroque music that we've always done with Escapedra. Mm -hmm. I've also enjoyed the contemporary music, the commissions that we've done. As I said before, I love Baroque music, same as same as Marianne, and you know Bach, Handel, all, all those types of things, both as a um, you know a choral singer and as a soloist as well. Um, I love also um, singing a lot of art song, so. I, I can't wait to be able to um, collaborate with a pianist and start singing some, you know, uh, Brahms and uh, Vaughan Williams, Samel Gar, stuff like that, really. I, I just love English song. I just, oh, it's my go-to when I'm feeling a bit rubbish. I'm really into contemporary music. One, one piece I conducted that really stays with me the whole time is um, a piece by James McMahon. James Macmillan called Cantos de Crado, which is the most exciting dynamic piece. And it was just absolutely electrifying, and that is something that stays in my mind. It's about the dispossessed in Latin, Latin America. It's not light. <laughs> Um, I've probably mostly been singing 80s power ballads throughout lockdown, so that's probably where I've mostly been at. Um, <laughs> what I really want to do, what I love singing, I love singing contemporary choral music. I just, I just love getting my brain working around it. Like I'm talking crazy stuff as well. I love it, real crazy stuff. Um, there's a there's a piece um, by David Fennessy um, called um, Letter to Michael which was, um, it's made me think about it because it was about his, um, this lady who was 
in a um, psychiatric hospital and she wrote all over her walls, come Mikael, come, come Michael, come. She wanted to be, she wanted, Michael's her husband, wanted him to come and get her. And this whole piece is just this cacophony of, it's um, like 16 voices. And it's just this incessant wailing of this sound and this, this woman in isolation. And it's like, that's how I feel. I need to have a good, I need to sing that right now. If you, you should find it, it's absolutely, unbelievably powerful uh, i think begin to come out of lockdown what what, what i've loved about uh, being in lockdown is the lack of um stress i had because i love doing concerts but i must say they are stressful and not to have that stress has been wonderful but now as we come back towards all of that i can find me finding myself with fear creeping up i don't know if anybody else is thinking like this Will I remember how to conduct and things like that? So it's all sorts of little things that I'm scared about going back to life before lockdown in case, in case everything's changed or in case I can no longer do the things that I thought I could do. Like, I mean, conducting can simply just do this, but you've got to do a lot of things all at the same time. It's dividing your brain uh, in a lot of different ways. You know, the old rubbing your tummy and patting your head type thing. Yeah, I think what you're all describing, <laughs> the loss of identity and the loss of loss of joy and the loss of community. Um, I think a lot of people will be uh, feeling exactly like that um, in their varying professions and areas of life. But do you think uh, that the, not wanting to always put positive spins on things, but do you think that there is a kind of real um, sense of when you do come back to, to making music with other people again, that of something that you can take from all of this, all of this withdrawal from everything, that, that do you think you'll, um, even if it's scary, even if it's terrifying, um, that you'll find some renewed enthusiasm and vigor and and joy really well for one I, I can't i can't wait to be able to sing with another musician of whatever sort you know to be able even if it's that just one person you know in a in a setting i can't i can't wait to have that collaboration i think the the process of music making is 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 magic really it, it's again it's the feedback and i think i'll appreciate that feeling so much more. I think that we won't do much singing for a, a bit when we get together because I think we'll all be in floods of tears. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm ready for that. You know, I think that, yeah, well, I will appreciate it all just so much. If the, it'll all, you know, whatever niggles one has, I think that they'll go out of the window at least for the first week or two. <laughs> Singing together, I can't, I can't wait for. I mean, I'm just, I think I'd probably cry my eyes out in the first moment <laughs> where I just <sighs> sing with another person. <laughs> I think I'll just break me completely, um, but in a good way, in a happy way. What lockdown has shown me is that I wasn't doing things right before. My priorities were not right. Um, I was running around from this to the other, to the next to the other, I, you know, throwing my children to this person for them to look after, to this person, to that person, you know, and I didn't have the priorities correct. And it's shown me now exactly the reasons why I can't go back to what it was. So it's it's been great for that. It's been a really good wake up call. It's been amazing for um, our family to spend this time together and to to get to know each other even more than we already did. It's probably highlighted to a lot of people that there are other things going on here. It's not just about going to work and it's, it has to be other things. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting um, for musicians and artists whose sense of identity is so much to do with who we are at work on the stage or, or teaching or however that comes across 
to to have the time to think about who we actually are with it all stripped away and and work out what really matters and what we want to do with that with the time that we have i suppose mm -hmm.